Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of the Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. Please subscribe and like us by pushing these buttons below. I will tell you a coincidence story. And when telling a coincidence story, I try to keep the listener in mind. I suggest a catchy title, a short description of the two incidents that create the coincidence, and what it seems to mean to the person telling it, in this case, me. The title of this coincidence story is, Are We Living in a Cartoon World? Is this the Truman Show for us? And here's the evidence that it might be. A few days ago, I was strolling along the river here in Charlottesville, Virginia. A man was coming toward me, talking loudly. Was he talking to me? As we came closer to each other, each of us turned towards each other while not breaking stride. He was wearing headphones, talking with someone. As we passed while he was talking with this other person, I turned towards him and he turned towards me, each of us still moving. We looked into each other's eyes and he said, you are a sensitive and intelligent person. I softly replied, thank you. He kept walking and talking into his microphone. This was like one of those movie scenes where one of the characters temporarily changes into a different personality to tell another character something they need to know about themselves. Here's evidence that we may all be players in some TV show being broadcast to people in a different dimension who are laughing a lot at what we are doing here. Our guest today is Ray Hernandez. Ray is a former atheist and rationalist. He is an estate attorney for the Department of Treasury. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty straight and pretty atheist. Well, he is atheist, rationalist, or he was. But then in 2012, Ray had a series of experiences that changed his life forever. He and his family experienced firsthand contact with non-human intelligence and UFOs, including one 45-minute encounter with a football field size craft. Additional paranormal experiences prompted Ray's shift into a profoundly spiritual life. He is director of the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, CCRI, whose website will be posted February 1st, 2022. Ray, thank you very much for coming to the show and welcome. Thank you, Bernard, for the invitation. It's good to have you with us. Please tell us that story that you've told so many times because it's so much changed your life, which I like to call Ray's song. <laughs> well, as you mentioned, uh, previous to March 4th, 2012, um, I was an overeducated uh, uh, materialist <laughs> that had gone to the, the finest um, graduate schools in the United States. Um, I was a professor for six years afterwards. Uh, I then transitioned to become um, an IRS uh, tax attorney. And then on that uh, day, March 4th, 2012, my reality, my life totally changed. Um, we had a um, a miraculous medical healing of our dog who was uh, totally paralyzed, who was gonna be euthanized later that afternoon by uh, what I now call an energy being. And that was a mutual experience with my wife and I. Um, and then after that initial experience, uh, my wife began to pray at night um, and these huge UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomenon would appear to her at um, 
close range uh, to her, uh, not like a little star in the sky, but like, you know, hanging over uh, houses. <laughs> um, and that lasted uh, for about six months. And then uh, I called down my first UAP and it was this huge object. It wasn't a physical uh, craft, but it was um, a very large configuration of lights. Um, and that was witnessed by my 10 year old daughter and these three adult friends. And then after that date, it be, began a series of um, nonstop um, paranormal experiences, which I call experiences via the contact modalities uh, for about three and a half years. And, um, and so uh, from that led to me trying to research um, uh, what, what was happening to me uh, and what was happening to others that I quickly learned about their, their experiences as well. And then uh, it led me to associate with uh, literally uh, more than a hundred academics and researchers uh, to undertake academic research on this phenomenon. What is your understanding now, Ray, of what happened to you uh, in that period of time you just described? <laughs> upon reflection, upon, <laughs> upon um, many years of, of learning about this phenomenon, what I understand is that um, the mind of God uh, is selecting individuals to awaken humanity at this crucial time uh, because of the necessity of it. Uh, we're entering um, a phase of, of humanity where we can literally uh, create self-annihilation uh, via ecological disasters, uh, 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 nuclear weapons, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think that um, individuals are being awakened at this time period to be able to change the way we, the modus operandi of humanity, how we operate um, uh, to, uh, for, for the better so we can avoid the self-destruction. We need to become much more spiritual. Uh, we need to become much more ecological, much more loving. And so um, these experiences that happened to me, um, I call them orchestrated events because uh, uh, the statistical probabilities of certain things that happened to me, that there's really no logical explanation of it. It's one event after another, after another, after another, which uh, um, you have your own specific terminology uh, for it. But to me, now that I uh, have learned much about the phenomenon as an experiencer, but also researching literally thousands of people that this is happening to, uh, I perceive them as orchestrated events by um, the, the greater reality, the mind of God. What you just said at the beginning of what this part of where humanity is at a crossroads now, we can either be dead as a, as a collective human organism, or we can flourish and become more spiritual and more loving with each other. And really, in my view, have a better time here on Earth than we're having. I mean, I, I think this is a great playground, uh, Earth is, and we could be having a lot better time than we are right now. And being spiritual and loving is part of that, but dancing around can be also part of that and a lot of other things. But I have not heard anyone say as clearly as you just did, Ray, that some higher intelligence, some people will call God or something that's beyond our brains to be able to conceptualize clearly is selecting certain individuals to become emissaries of a new spirituality to awaken humanity to what it needs to do to transform. So my question for you, Ray, how come Ray Hernandez was selected for this <laughs> um, I believe I was selected for this. And again, I don't want to sound egotistical. It has nothing to do with ego. Um, and I really talk like, like what I just mentioned, because it just comes out like a cult, like a guru, and the ego starts flowing with so many people. Um, no, it's, it's the antithesis of that. But why me? I, I think it's because I've always been um, a rebel. I've always been an organizer. 
for example, um, at Berkeley, I organized um, um, uh, uh, a, a, a movement of graduate minority students uh, to pressure the graduate deans and the chairs of, of departments, graduate departments at Berkeley to begin to, um, to advertise and to, uh, and to scrutinize a larger percent of minority students uh, at Berkeley. Berkeley is a, a state school, okay? It's state funded. It's not Harvard or Yale or private school. But yet in my department, I was the first minority student in eight years to be admitted to the PhD program. I mean, unbelievable. And we're talking about city and regional planning. We're talking about programs that deal with, with housing, with economic development, with urban blight. With Hispanic so. people. Yes, and, 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 and people of color in, in major cities. Um, uh, but yet, you know, the first PhD student in eight years, I mean, that was like horrendous. They even had a master's program. The, uh, the year before, they had four individuals out of 50 that matriculated, four. Okay, 8% that were minority students. I, I, I understand the outrage very clearly, Ray. Yeah, and, and yeah. What, what I get from what you just have said is that you are a rebel, that you are a person who sees what needs to be done to break the current structure. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I, I know how to get things done. For example- And you know how to- And I know how to get things done. We uh, picketed the departments for more than a year. Afterwards, they gave a recruiting budget and I organized 50 students, graduate students, to go out to different cities to recruit for their specific department. It was like we had a massive wave of recruitment. We more than doubled and tripled and quadrupled the number of PhD students that were admitted into the graduate programs at Berkeley uh, without lowering the GPAs or, or the, uh, their standards. You um, are, you are, your passion right now <laughs> is making it pretty clear to me one of the reasons that you were picked for this. You have passion and you have organizing ca capabilities. That, 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 that's what's needed. Uh, uh, and, and that's what's but, needed. And that's what you're doing now. But let's, let's, let's back up a bit now and go, go to that six months or so with your contact with non-human intelligence and you, the mind expanding that you did and they helped you do during that period of time to go from a Berkeley rebel to a now a different level of rebel was trying to say, hey, we can't keep doing it the same way, the same process. But what made, what happened to you, Ray Fernandez, Hernandez? What happened to you? Okay, let, let me talk about uh, one of these orchestrated events. Please do. Uh, you cannot um, do the work that I'm doing now unless you fully understand that you are an eternal spiritual being, okay? That we're totally outside the materialist paradigm. And to me, I was, um, you know, I, I could have put my last dollar that you would not have changed me <laughs> from my atheist uh, uh, beliefs. Uh, that's how hardcore I was, like so many other scientists and, and, and academics uh, are coming from materialist paradigm. So what they did is over a four month period, uh, they forced me, that's the word forced, forced me to read hundreds of books and academic articles on near death experiences, okay? And then um, I won't go into the details because it'll take too long, but basically over three days, December 21st, 2012, December 22nd, 2012, December 23rd, 2012, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the very first three people I ever mentioned NDEs to, all of them had it, okay? And the first two people that I mentioned it to, uh, 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 it was a robotic voice that came out of me. Uh, the first one was my daughter's pediatrician. Um, um, she's robotic, voice, a robotic voice came out of you? Yes. Let, let me uh, give you an illustration of what happened. Okay. Here I was initially after I saw that huge uh, UAP in uh, late August. Okay. The very next day, I saw a YouTube video on near-death experiences. Totally blew me away. So I, I ordered like 10 books. On, on near-death experiences, used books, obviously. <laughs> and I began to listen every night to um, a YouTube video of an experiencer that had an NDE. And I'd be reading these books. It was like four hours a day. 
As time went on, I became more infatuated with the with the researching that phenomenon. So it was 20 books and then 30 books. And it was from four hours a day. Now, fast forward four months later, it was literally 18 hours a day. Every hour of, of me being awake, I would not do my IRS tax work, okay? For a whole month, I would not shower. I would not shave. I was like um, Howard Hughes holed up in his penthouse in Las Vegas, um, just reading 18 hours a day, uh, uh, these NDE books. Now, you, were, you said you were forced to do that. Please, yes. des please describe that force. Oh, that's happened several times before. Uh, where uh, you get to the point where there's nothing else that you can think about. Um, um, I didn't watch TV. I didn't go to the internet. I didn't care. Uh, about I understand that part. My of wife. It. I didn't care about my I, wife, my you, daughter. I didn't care about work. I, I understand that part of it, but you were yeah. forced to do that. It was like some external power was making you do this, is what I heard. Correct. That, that's, how, um, that's how it felt like. Like I couldn't so, let go of it. It, it's like you have to totally be, for example, my wife was, I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to leave you. Okay. If you don't change, cause you're acting like a madman. Okay. And I was like, okay, let me just finish. Uh, oh, she wanted me to go to a psychiatrist to go people of your profession. Okay. Get some bills. Okay. <laughs> to chill me out. And I was like, okay, I'll go, but let me finish this last book. Let me finish this. Last book. <laughs> okay. After I finish this last book, I'll go. I go, I swear to God, I swear to God, you know? And so after I finished that book, it's like, no, there's one more, there's one more I, I need to read. There's one more book. That's an illustration of, of what I meant. I was forced to do it. Um, okay. 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 That's clear and, enough. And now, that, now let me tell you okay. about the robotic voice. That's okay? what I want to hear. Okay. Yeah. When I was um, um, uh, in front of my daughter's pediatrician, she had a, a fever for two straight days. She says, I've got some good news. You know, we checked her ear, nose and throat. You know, uh, I didn't see anything. She doesn't have a temperature. Maybe it was a, a, a 24 hour flu, you know. Um, and so I said, oh, thank you, doctor. I said, Excuse me, doctor. Have you ever heard the term near-death experiences? I've just finished approximately 300 books on this phenomenon, many of them written by medical doctors such as yourself, and this phenomenon you need to know about. Now, as that voice came out in my head, I was like, holy cow, you know, I'm schizophrenic. I got another personality in me. What the hell's going on? My wife is right. I'm going insane. You know, I need to go to a psychiatrist. And then the doctor's eyeballs were like this. And I said, oh, my God, now this woman thinks I'm crazy. You know, I said, excuse me, doctor. I apologize. I don't know why I said that. No, no, there's no need to apologize. How did you know I had one? And that's in front of my daughter, who was 10 years old at that time. She then stops her practice <laughs> and for the next 15 minutes gives us the detail of her NDE. OK, so that was on a Friday. The next day was a church social um, uh, dinner uh, for the Spanish uh, ministry. Okay, it was all married couple, uh, mostly people 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, that were there. And so uh, my wife sat next to this Mexican lady. Uh, she introduced me to her husband, who was born in Cuba, like I was. And then we had some small talk for like a minute. Um, what, the, what year did you come? And this and that. And all this. Excuse me, Max. I've just finished reading a price with 300 books, you know, ex ditto, the same exact thing. And I was like convinced that I'm not well. I need to go to see a shrink, you know, um, not a shrink, a, to take some pills, go people like you, a psychiatrist, okay? And uh, all of a sudden, Max was like, oh my God, Ray, I've never told this to anyone. And then he tells me about the NDE of his mother who died in his arms the year before. When he got to the hospital, um, uh, the mother said, you know, you were giving me CPR, you were breathing on me, you were pounding my chest, and you were crying on top of me, and you told me this, you told me that, you told me that, and all of a sudden, this heavy set black man, black man with a, um, uh, um, uh, followed by a blonde woman with a, a blonde ponytail, comes crashing through the doors, but mom, how did you know that? Those were the paramedics. I told you, I was on top of you, I was seeing everything and hearing everything, you know, and so uh, he then tells me all the details of her mother's NDE. The next day, I said, I better tell this to my father, because my father was like the Cuban Archie Bunker, you know, he only had been to church twice, and there's always goddamn this, goddamn that, you know, he had zero sense of spirituality. And, and now I hadn't had spirituality because it never, it didn't click in yet. You know, <laughs> the four months were related to what happened in the last two days. And then oh, um, I got my father uh, and my mother together and he was very ill, very, very sick, uh, bedridden. And we got him dressed. We brought him on his walker outside, uh, sat at the, 
the, the, the table outside. And um, I told him what happened on Friday, what happened on Saturday. Ah, that happened to me. He, he had the most profound NDE of any book I've ever read. Okay, he, he told me he was up there for 20 to 30 years. Why? Because that's how long it took God to show me all the good things I'd done in my life and all the bad things. And he went on to details and details. And I was like, blown away. And um, I, I won't give you the details of what happened, because it just take too long. But basically, when I went home, okay, for the first time in my life, I looked up at the sky, and I spoke with God. And to these modern angels, which are the intermediaries that have been working with me. And I said, I want to thank you, because in a four month period, you have managed to totally transform an atheist material rationalist. And, uh, and I know uh, uh, I know that I'm an eternal spiritual being, and it's not a belief. And I have that knowingness more than any Catholic priest in Miami. And for that, I want to thank you. And then after that, I never read an ND, NDE book again. And after that, it's like, I know I'm an eternal spiritual being. You know, there, there's no if, ands, or buts <laughs> about it. But and it was the NDE training that gave me that information. That's thank you, Ray. Um, just a little sidelight. You may recall at the beginning, I talked about a guy talking to me as if he was like somebody from a movie that had been taken over by a different voice. And this is what you're kind of describing here when you, you got taken over and you're talking in a robotic voice. So that, that suggests to me the kind of coincidence that I experience that I can almost predict by the story I pick the what's going to happen sometimes in the in our interview and that's that's the level I function on but when you start putting those little things together like the robotic voice in my introduction story you begin to wonder how this all gets orchestrated how does it all get orchestrated Ray well again uh, we don't have enough time to show you my development to show why I've arrived at certain hypotheses, but I believe that there is a non-religious God, okay? Um, very similar to what the ancient um, uh, philosophical traditions uh, spoke about, uh, starting with uh, the Vedic tradition, okay? Uh, again, we're, we're inside a greater reality. That's the title of my new book, okay? And we're dealing with this universal mind that's, uh, um, that, 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 that is initiating all of our life experiences. I believe that we, uh, before we are born, we are part of God, okay? We then um, are born to experience information to relay back to God. Okay, the NDE phenomena, uh, what it has taught NDE experiencers, and, and I'm saying this from the mouthpiece of Raymond Moody, Dr. Jeffrey Long, Dr. Uh, Kenneth Ring, um, uh, and people have been researching on the NDE phenomenon for 30 years. Uh, they all said the most important message that NDE experiencers receive, if you were just to pick one message, and that is we need to learn how to love each other. Okay, once we return, it's not about material wealth, is it what, what church you go to, what religion you are, you know, ego and all these other things. It's about learning how to love. Okay, when people have an NDE, what they talk about most profoundly is the love that they feel is and they can't describe it. They said it's not even the love of a of a mother and, and, and a child, you know, it's like that times a billion. Okay, so I think that we're here to learn how to love in this uh, reality. But yet, uh, like Raymond Moody told me, he says, Ray, a day doesn't go by where I feel like choking somebody, okay? And what he meant by that was that this is the most important message that we need to learn in this reality, but yet it's the most difficult to accomplish. Agreed, okay. agreed. That's why I think I'm involved with this because the Coincidence Project has as part of its mission is the greatest thing you can ever learn is how to love and be loved in return. It's not just love, you have to be able to be able to receive it, which is very difficult for some people. And because I'm a psychiatrist, 
and I've written books about psychotherapy. I'm not just a, I'm not just a pill giver. I'm a psychotherapist. <laughs> I, I apologize. I didn't mean it in that direction, but I mean well, uh, it, it, it is more the way psychiatrists yeah. are now, but there's yeah. fewer, fewer of, of us. And so I'm trying to write a book um, called A Psychotherapy for the Collective Human Organism. That the intent of it is just what we're talking about, to learn not only to love, but to be able to feel love in return. And that is a very difficult thing, as you are saying. I'm so pleased to hear you say how difficult that is. So thank you for that. And you're reaffirming something that I've thought and saying it so articulately. Let us go to some of the, the, the information you have, Ray, about these intermediary experiences that lead to understanding that we all need to be able to learn how to love and be loved in return. Tell us about your UFO, non-human non intelligent contact, and the parapsychological things that come along with it. I think it's important that people hear what you told me earlier, that people tend to put the UFOs in a materialistic plane, and that's wrong because what happens is when you have a UFO contact, a contact with a non-human intelligence, you begin to have many more parapsychological experiences. Please elaborate on that, Ray. Yes, yes, I'll try to be succinct, which is almost impossible, but- uh, <laughs> I'll help, but, but, I'll help. <laughs> okay, but basically um, I had an experience in May of 2013, which uh, again, going back to these orchestrated events, uh, three days in a row, um, the mind of God introduced me to one of the, the leading UFO researchers that works with contactees all over the world. She's been doing this for over 30 years. That Her name is Mary Rodwell. The next day, I received a phone call from Dr. Rudy Shields, an emeritus professor of astrophysics from Harvard University. And then um, later on that afternoon, uh, I spoke with Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon and the founder of the Institute for Noetic Sciences. Um, um, I could give a much more extensive bio on him. Uh, and um, Edgar invited to me to his house the very next day. So uh, at his house was where this um, research organization, the very first one of two, uh, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation got started. So within 48 hours, okay, uh, I was in Edgar's living room and the organization got started. And the four co-founders were the four people that were put in my place who I'd never met before. Mary Rodwell, Rudy Shields, Edgar Mitchell, and myself. And then that um, uh, I told Edgar about what happened to me um, 48 hours before. And that was I was driving in my car in the middle of a traffic jam. I was then um, brought to a, another reality. Uh, I refer to it as a matrix reality. <laughs> it's not our three-dimensional physical reality. And there I was shown and given downloads of, of, of information about the nature of our reality and what I now call the contact modalities, that it all needs to be studied as one phenomenon instead of separate and distinct, and that what humans are calling consciousness, which is the very fabric of our reality, is the glue that's holding it all together. And I was given a mission uh, of what I needed to do. But I didn't understand what that mission was. Uh, and even when I went to Edgar's house, he told me that Rudy and, and he will help me with that mission. But uh, uh, I had zero understanding of what it was going to be. And then I woke up on a Saturday morning. And this happened three times to me, these Saturday mornings that you awaken. Uh, and all of a sudden, I knew what I needed to do. And I typed it up, five pages. What we needed to do was the world's first comprehensive academic statistical research study of UFO contact experiencers. Why? Because if the UFO contact phenomenon is integrated um, with near-death experiences, with out-of-body experiences, with people that see ghosts and spirits, with hallucinogenic um, uh, uh, journeys via DMT, uh, magic mushrooms, et cetera, um, and uh, channeling, the channeling phenomenon, the, the psi phenomenon, we, we precognition all this. If all of this is to be studied as one integrated phenomenon, we know nothing about the UFO contact phenomenon because I, I, I was calling down and seeing many, many different UAPs, okay? So that's what we did. We embarked on a five-year academic research study 
to understand the phenomenon. And what our findings revealed, and you have our book, it's a huge 800 page book. Um, uh, what our findings revealed is that um, the phenomenon um, totally contradicts what is circulating in materialist mainstream ufology. And um, the reason for that, as I uh, alluded to earlier, is that historically, the field of ufology, anytime they heard of any um, contact with an intelligence, uh, let alone anything paranormal associated with that contact, it was immediately dismissed by all of the early researchers in ufology. And, um, why, and what, the, why, what, why was that, Ray? Why did they well, dismiss parapsychology? Well, the, yeah, the, there was uh, two very prominent early researchers in ufology that held that position. One was Major Kehoe. Um, he was a retired uh, 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 major from the military, and he devoted much of his latter uh, years of his life to researching ufology. Um, he had a research team that collected cases of UFO sightings, UFO land, supposedly UFO landings. And anytime people talk, told him about um, contact with any type of beings or any type of paranormal experiences um, on, on purpose, he said, you know, keep it quiet. He never pushed that. He never uh, uh, um, spread that information because it felt that it was reduced credibility. Because here we are trying to get credibility just about a material UFO. You know, now we're introducing, you know, intelligences, non-human intelligences and the paranormal. It's the, they'll think that that whole field is filled with lunatics. And then also the father of modern ufology, which is uh, J. Allen Hynek, who is a professor of astronomy. And he was um, the main researcher in uh, Project Blue Book that formally researched uh, uh, UFOs in the 50s and 60s. Uh, um, he initially was uh, there to debunk the phenomenon. Then he, based upon the case studies, learned that these experiences were very, very real towards the end of his, and also anyone that tried to push the contactee aspect of it or the uh, paranormal aspect of it, it, it totally squashed them. What, what, didn't what want to publicize the contactee part of it? Um, could you describe those contactee experiences and put them in a parapsychological greater consciousness perspective? Okay, uh, for, for example, um, people um, in, in our survey have seen literally thousands of different types of physical beings. Okay, um, and for example. Uh, like in my case, I, I, I've seen three major UAPs, okay, in my life, my wife even more, but yet we've, uh, my wife have seen um, perceived physical beings dressed in white munch robes floating right in front of her, okay, she's seen different types of animals uh, that are not known animals, like for example, uh, uh, a, be a being that's like two or three feet tall that had a very long tail and um, uh, the head uh, of uh, indescribable head that literally glided over our six foot fence, okay, in Miami, Florida. Um, here she saw a, uh, a wolf, a perceived wolf, a white wolf, like three times right outside her house. And um, so, uh, and my wife is, you know, not insane. She's most of the time normal, but yet people are seeing six foot owls. For example, a very famous Hollywood producer, uh, his wife um, saw a six foot owl uh, with their legs crossed, had humanoid legs on their bathroom vanity. Okay. And yet they were in this middle of seeing tons of UFOs, all these paranormal experiences, out of body experiences. And uh, this person won three Academy Awards like three years ago. Okay. And so that's just an example of the thousands of stories that are out there. Medical doctors have told me stories, unbelievable stories. So the phenomenon of seeing UFOs is associated with out-of-body experiences, with near-death experiences, seeing ghosts and spirits, et cetera, et cetera. So anytime these early researchers heard these crazy, perceived crazy stories, they said, we cannot circulate this information because we're trying to get basic credibility just about the physicalist UFO phenomenon. That's, now, a, great, that's a great answer to the question. Oh, go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Now, what I was going to say is J. Allen Hynek, who is uh, the perceived father of modern ufology, towards the end of his life, Okay, when like a few years before he died, he totally flipped. Okay, 
um, um, he knew that the UFO phenomenon was very, very real phenomenon, but he was still a materialist, okay? Towards the very end of his life, he was beginning to question whether these were consciousness-based phenomenon, because by then he had so much data through his interviews of these cases that these experiences, and he said in several of his last writings, that these experiences were both uh, physical experiences, but yet psyche experiences. And he uh, hypothesized that these were consciousness-based phenomenon, okay? Um, and Dr. Jacques Vallée, who uh, is probably the most, by far, the most well-known researcher of the, the UAP phenomenon, he's been saying that for 40 years because he was a very close friend of uh, J. Allen Hynek, and they work very close together. And uh, he's written about 12 books on the phenomenon. And um, literally the last 40 years has been carrying the torch of J. Allen Hynek, that he doesn't believe that these are ETs, that these coming from a physical planet, you know, that these are extraterrestrial. And, and, and he, but you're never able to pin him down. His response was always, uh, well, do you think that these are uh, intelligence that are coming from another uh, multiverse? another dimension, and this response is always, we just don't understand space-time, okay? Because <laughs> he never wants to be pigeonholed in a certain area because I think he doesn't know. So he always says, we don't understand space-time. But you, you, know? do, you do know as best as you can know anything, Ray, that these, these paranormal experiences, which include the, the near-death experiences, the ghosts, the spirits, the, um, the other um, telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, among other things, um, that this list of, of what are seen to be separate phenomena are really part of a, a greater phenomenon. If there's, right. any, if there's any message you have, which is similar to what I am doing on Earth uh, with people and having ordinary experiences of meaningful coincidences is trying to say there's something else going on here. There is a greater reality of which we are a part. And these are suggestions for us to change our ways of looking at things. Well, yeah, that, yes, go ahead, please. I, I, I talked to us about how these pieces uh, fit together for you to indicate that there is a greater reality of which we are a part. Well, that's the title of uh, my next forthcoming book. Um, and we have uh, uh, five co-editors for it. I'm just one of them. But it's basically, it's my brainchild. Um, and, and it's exactly what you just said. <laughs> the, I, the title of the book is A Greater Reality, The New Paradigm, of non-local consciousness, the paranormal and the contact modalities. Now, a new paradigm because it's a new way of thinking, okay? Uh, um, just like the dinosaurs, the old materialist ways are gonna be dying out and this new paradigm is gonna be established. We use the term non-local consciousness and we have a whole chapter on non-local consciousness because there are various theories that have been put out there um, starting with Edgar Mitchell, we have his magnum opus article on non-local consciousness, which is how um, humans are able to tap the binary codes, information uh, of our reality, and extract information from the greater reality, um, and, um, and, 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 and are having these uh, a paranormal uh, type of experiences and precognition, etc. And so, um, and then the contact modality is a term that I use to talk about that whole umbrella of these paranormal contact experiences. These are all experiences that humans are, are having contact with some form of intelligence in diverse ways. And um, so half of our, we have four volumes. The first two volumes are theoretical in nature. And you got to see the table of contents. Um, and it's literally, it's a who's who of, um, of academics and authors that have been researching the diversity of these phenomena. So we're going to have certain articles that are going to be focusing on, on consciousness, different approaches to the nature of our reality. Okay, what is consciousness? And then we subdivide it into various categories. Uh, the near-death experiences, the out-of-body experiences, the, the UFO. For example, just on UFOs, we have 10 articles. All of them are all uh, post-materialist approaches to, um, to the UFO uh, 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 phenomenon. 
linking it to consciousness. Uh, we have uh, various articles. One is by a professor at John Hopkins on hallucinogenic journeys and how, uh, you know, a very large percent of these people under the influence of D DMT and, and psilocybin uh, are having these contact experiences with perceived non-human intelligence. So what we want the, uh, the, the uh, oh, and that's the first two chapters. The, the last two chapters are articles by major experiencers. Now, the vast majority of them uh, I'll give you an illustration. Is um, uh, the first one is a pediatrician. She's still practicing. She's my age, maybe a year younger, um, and uh, totally did not want to disclose this information to anyone. And I finally convinced her of the importance of it because there's literally five doctors that I know that are having major experiences like she does, and uh, almost everyone wishes to remain quiet. So here's this medical doctor. She has had two NDEs, okay? Her second one was like so profound. And she articulates that in her article. Um, after her second NDE, she began to see deceased people in her hospital, okay? Like uh, uh, an individual that was in a patient uh, hospital uh, gown um, that goes right through a wall, <laughs> you know? Not, not the wall, um, an elevator, right into the, the metal of the elevator and other experiences like that. And that was witnessed by other nurses that she was with. Um, she um, um, has seen 12 UFOs, okay? Um, half of them very up close. Um, uh, three times this huge triangle-shaped craft um, went right over her and blocked out all the stars in the sky. Out of those three, uh, her husband was with her twice. And her husband is a, uh, an arborist, you know, got a bachelor's of science <laughs> in, in forestry. And, and she lived right across the street from a national forest, like tens of thousands of acres. And um, she's seen Sasquatch three times, uh, twice very up close with her. I mean, out of body experiences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a woman that's kept quiet all these years. I'm, I'm amazed and, at how well you're able to remember the, all these details, Ray. I, I'm getting a clearer idea of why you're in this while you're in this role right now, but I have this question I have for you yeah. is your major idea seems to be conceptual at this point from what you described of your new book, uh, A New Reality, is, is to be able to use the data to say it's all one consciousness of which we are a part. And what I'm interested in is how this idea is going to be transmuted or trans or, or translated into learning how to love and be loved well you're talking about numerous steps of of human evolution <laughs> I am. to get to that point unfortunately uh, but um it, it first starts with a realization that we are eternal spiritual beings within a greater reality you know once you begin to understand that that uh that 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 apparatus, um, uh, then you can begin undertaking the spiritual evolution uh, from that basic understanding, um, and so it's it's a I, I believe it's a multi generational process. I don't know if we have multi generations. We don't have evolve. time. We don't have time to do that. We don't have time to do no, that. No, we, okay. we got to do we got to do it faster than well, multi generations. That, that, that's why I am full speed with the foot on the accelerator. Okay, you certainly all, are <laughs> all of my life, you know, uh, after I get rid of all my BS, you know, IRS tax work, which is a full time job is dedicated to this. Um, uh, for example, that research study that we did on, on UFO contact experiencers. No one has ever done that. But the problem is, and this goes into the multi generational aspect of it is that no one has ever read that book. Okay, because it's too dense. It's too theoretical, even though we wrote it in a simplistic language. For everyone to understand and um and even the people within the field of ufology you know the major researchers that speak at all these ufology conferences they don't even know about it because they don't even bother to talk about it because it doesn't deal with nuts and bolts um and and so let alone you know you're talking about you know these deep uh, philosophical and theological uh, uh, undertones of of a greater reality um, but yet that that's what it is, <laughs> and, but and that's we, what it is. So your yeah. mission is to 
elevate people's knowledge and experience of this greater reality uh, it, right, that's right here with us. How, how is that going to lead to becoming able to love and be loved in return? Okay, let me give you an explanation for that, okay? Um, the academic literature on how near-death experiences evolved and changed, okay? That initially was started by Dr. Kenneth Ring in his 1996 um, book titled The Omega Project. He uh, did a statistical research study of 85 NDE experiencers with 85 people who had UFO contact experiences. Okay, he has the same questions of both groups. Now, approximately one third of those questions dealt with how did, did this individual change from a worldview and a philosophical uh, worldview. So he asked questions, you know, in terms of uh, materialism. How were you before? How are you now? Your belief in religion, your spirituality, um, uh, ego, um, uh, consciously aware. It was like 60 questions. And what he found out was that both groups in, in, uh, in the same percentages, like 85% of these people totally changed, had a total transformation. They didn't fear death. They became less egotistical, much more loving, much more caring, um, um, much more spiritual, less religious, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I'll, uh, I'll add a different fi an, an additional yeah. finding from Bruce Grayson, yeah. who, who used my weird coincidence survey, which is a measure self-report of frequency of weird of meaningful coincidences in the same way you just described before and after and in this very simple kind of question yes yeah. again they experienced more meaningful coincidences after their near-death experience yes uh, one person that you need to bring on your show uh, uh she's also a medical doctor her name is dr yvonne case and she has an organization that deals with spiritually transformative experiences Okay, um, and uh, and she every uh, a month she invites a speaker. She has webinars. Uh, she's again full blast doing very similar mission, and uh, she's had five NDEs. Okay, and also just like um, uh, our uh, the medical doctor, doc, Dr. Melinda Greer, um, I can mention her name because she's soon to be very public. <laughs> um, Yvonne has had everything in the kitchen sink, you know. Um, UFOs, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, and seeing deceased people, okay? Um, but yet, it took her many years to begin to open up to all of this because uh, she wanted to maintain credibility. So she wrote a book about her NDEs, and that's what she focused upon for many years, her NDEs. But, um, uh, but this transformation, we duplicated those same questions from Dr. Kenneth Ring's statistical study to the UFO contact experiencers. But now we had not 85 people, we had 4,400 people that took our surveys. And guess what? The same exact amount. Uh, these people totally changed to, um, uh, to the way, the personality profile that I discussed earlier. It was a complete and radical worldview transformation. So again, getting back to your question, how do we uh, get everyone to change in that direction? Well. You know, the simplistic uh, question is give everybody an NDE, give people UFO contact experiences, you know, but there's many different ways that people can pierce the veil of our reality. One is through um, meditation, holotropic breathing while you're doing meditation. A lot of people have altered states of consciousness being we are doing that. Um, there's a lot of groups that are doing uh, human initiated contact experiences where they're going out as a group to isolated areas and they're calling down UFOs. And most of these groups, it might take, you know, a few months to do it, but are very successful. They'll see a, a couple of little, you know, stars in the sky and some will say, okay, go to the right. And all of a sudden, boom, it's moving to the right. Okay, go to the left. It's moving to the left. Just that experience alone totally transforms people, okay? Like the ways that we've been talking about. Um, is there any way that we can induce near-death experiences to people, you know? Um, so again, uh, besides these I'm radical, I'm suggesting that an accumulation of meaningful coincidence experiences yep. can do that in a more gradual way, yes. rather and, and instead of the big way which so many people yep. have had. So yep. it's a 
I'm a gradualist. That's my part in this. That I I do this kind of in not like you. You got blasted with it. Oh yeah, yeah. It was. I've been yeah. I've been looking for weird stuff for much of my life. And you know, when I was like uh, in high school, I wanted to be called back to some my my original home. I was as I looked at the moon. I knew there was something that that was not all here. And I've always said there is. They're not telling us something here. <laughs> They're not telling yeah. us something. It's it's uh, the, what what's important, equally as important as um, the work that I'm doing, is to individuals to self reflect upon their life and to yes. understand these orchestrated events. Um, that uh, um, that that these are not quote unquote coincidences. Okay, but yeah. they need to be able to have that space like like what you just articulated of self reflecting upon their lives their experiences and begin connecting the dots and if you do start that process of connecting the dots you're going to get to the same place that agreed and that's what i am doing in my way in this connecting small dots or multiple yeah, dots yeah. instead of the blast so there are various ways to be able to do it and yeah we have we each of us has our different way but the end is the same what what you're saying um that i think is so important as we we're coming to the end we have about five or so minutes left ray is is that these transformative experiences that you are so deeply studying and so deeply immersed in are ones that are going to increase the number of people like you who are spiritually growing and become spiritually aware uh, that we are part of a greater reality and that consciousness we share with each other. I will suggest you something that I want to see what you think about. I believe that we have uh, our mental atmosphere, which I call the psychosphere. And I'm just saying it's here on earth and it's partially materialistic. It isn't all just like our bodies and minds are partially materialistic. We share both of these. And this psychosphere has a web of connections in it that are are alive sometimes and not so alive um, and that we can start them. And it is through this web of connections that we make telepathic connections with each other. For example, my father was choking on his own blood and 3000 miles away, I was choking uncontrollably. And I only found that out later that we, we are connected through these webs that get activated. And the, those, what I'm suggesting here is the interpersonal importance, not, not this just for me and my consciousness, which is what I tend to think happens a lot i'm 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 for um eternal i am part of greater consciousness i love the love that i felt when i was there but how you get that transferred into like doing that with each other recognizing the spirituality in the other person i think coincidences can help mark the pathways to, by of those connections what do you think of that no i mean that's 100 correct um, we have um, a theoretical chapter, uh, not chapter, section in our book uh, under the topic of non-local consciousness and telepathy, okay, which deals exactly with what you are articulated. And we have um, some articles that are, you know, very physics-based articles that talk about that process and others more um, non-physicist, but theoretical articles. Um, again, getting back to that. And... Um, uh, Dean Radin has spoken, as has written about that. Um, he's the lead scientist at the organization that Dr. Edgar Mitchell founded, the Institute for Noetic Sciences. Um, um, for example, uh, one of his books, The Conscious Universe, talks about how um, uh, we're all tapping into these information fields and uh, how ESP works, how precognition works, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we're all inter interacting with each other's um, uh, some people call it biosphere, you yeah. know, of, uh, yeah. of, of, in, of information. So that's taking place all the time beyond the shadow of a doubt. And, and um, uh, there's two academics that we spoke with that are, uh, um, have a, a biology background. One, uh, Dr. Glenn Ryan, he's a PhD biochemist from um, University of London. 
um, and we just recently interviewed him in, in Boston. And, 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 and he has a chapter in, in our, um, our book, uh, very similar to what you're doing, but how um, uh, he applied the topic of Dr. Edgar Mitchell's um, um, a paper that's gonna be in our book about non-local consciousness. And he applied it to all aspects of contact with non-human intelligence, but it also can be applied to aspects of contact via other humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, guess, it's that, the same phenomenon. That that's an important idea to hear from you that it can be applied to other people. Now, yeah, it's, have, it's the same phenomenon. It's the same phenomenon. That's good. Well, we're we've we've come to the end of our time, Ray, and I, and just as a way of people being able to um, get to know you better. Uh, maybe you could tell us something about yourself personally that uh, we can take away from uh, our, our interview, our discussion today. Okay. Um, it's important for individuals to understand that um, um, we're going to be coming out with this very, very important new book. Um, I'm going to be putting it all on Kindle. Uh, it's going to be four volumes over 2,000 pages, and it's going to be put on Kindle for like, you know, 1995 or something like that. So it's almost giving it away. Um, but, but that book is a paradigm changing uh, um, literature, and it's both for the experiencer and for the theoretician. And, um, and I could also uh, give away like, like four or five chapters from that book, and also literally half of that book. Uh, beyond UFOs. <laughs> uh, uh, I could give people, you know, most of, of, of that book for free. Just send me an email to uh, info, I-N-F-O, at experiencer.org. Um, and I will send you all this information. And uh, the last message I could say to everyone uh, that are listening to you um, is that uh, we live in a greater reality. We just don't understand the complexities of this greater reality, but we're slowly uh, uh, getting a better understanding of it. Uh, but we, what I know is that the basis of this greater reality is the concept of love, um, uh, that love is the, the foundation of this greater reality, and that we need to begin to learn to forgive, to trust, to love uh, uh, one another. And once we begin to do that, humanity will, uh, will be cleansed of all of the problems that we have. Um, Wonderful. It's a spiritual transformation. Wonderful. And let's end with about something about Ray Hernandez himself. Just uh, you've told us what you're doing and what the book's coming out, but who who are you besides the uh, tax lawyer and uh, our, our, and others? And you, you have a family, you have a wife, you have kids, you have a dog, you had a dog or have a dog. To tell us something about you as, as Ray Hernandez. Um, I'm, I'm awakened. I know that I don't die. I don't physically die. And I'm here learning in this reality. We're, we're here to, to learn the complexities of it. And I hope that everyone that listens to you continues with that approach, that we need to continue to evolve. We need to learn because our reality is extremely complex, but yet at the same time, very simple. So Ray Hernandez has been awakened to an individual that wants to learn. Wonderful, Ray. Wonderful, Ray. Th thank you very much for taking the time out of your, I know, very busy schedule. You are a busy guy for sure. You have a lot you're doing and you are a transformer of humanity. And uh, I very much appreciate having the time to talk with you. Thank you so very much, Bernard. It's been an honor. Uh, I've learned from your work, from uh, listening to several of your uh, 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 podcasts, and, and I hope to learn much more from you in the future. Thank you very, very much, Ray. Thank you very much. The psychosphere is a mental atmosphere Like a hologram of cosmic consciousness